welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. I am James Just, and with me today is Jason McPhee from the Knuckleheads of Liberty podcast. Jason, media experts are at it again. They uh, predicted that you know inflation numbers weren't going to be as bad as, as as everybody thought. They had predicted that you know the inflation wasn't as bad, and that you know everything was going better. That's what kind of the media predictions. And then the real inflation numbers came out and the stock market tanked because of course inflation was higher than they had predicted. It's being stubborn, which of course for some of us is no <laughs> not no surprise, right? We all predicted this for a long time. But with the inflation data higher than it is, my point is, you know, why are we still listening to these people? At some at this point, why are we still listening to these media experts? Well, I mean, my gosh, I mean, if, if nothing else, COVID should have taught us to be a little bit skeptical of all these experts <laughs> because, my gosh, I mean, you think about the amount of damage that's been done to the economy just over that. I mean, uh, literally, this, all these lockdowns and everything else. But then, of course, uh, uh, Biden is sort of the... Uh, that, that's what ushered Biden into office. And now, of course, he's made all kinds of uh, projections. I remember uh, Paul Krugman, when Biden first came into office, was saying, um, you know, get ready for the Biden boom. <laughs> of course, yeah. The boom was a little bit of an explosion, I think, <laughs> yeah, in the economy. <laughs> but in the sense of it all burning down. <laughs> it was an M80 in a, in, in a trash can, right? That was the boom. It yeah. was nothing. <laughs> We've all kind of fallen on our face. Yeah. And this is, what was it, a year ago they were talking, well, no, inflation wasn't real. Then it was transitory, right? Mm -hmm. And then what was the next excuse? It, was, it wasn't real. It was transitory. And then it was no big deal. It was fine. Yeah. It was actually good, right? Inflation was good. They tried to tell us inflation was actually good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, just one thing after another with these guys. And, of course, uh, it, you know, I, I can't think of anything more comical than Biden having a celebration at the White House on, I believe it was either Monday or Tuesday, uh, saying how, uh, what a great job they done with this Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which essentially spent a whole bunch of money on uh, environmental and IRS stuff, <laughs> just a whole bunch of items that are sort of unrelated to inflation other than the fact that they're spending more money, which is actually not good for inflation. <laughs> no, because they have to, they're having to print the money to yeah. spend it. And yes. so when you print more money, you put more money in circulation at a time when the econo economies are shrinking. Well, you've got no place to go but inflation. <laughs> well, but the, the, the crazy thing was, while he was having a celebration at the White House over this, they brought in a uh, singer. I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head. But uh, essentially, it was this big uh, celebration that they were trying to have about how well he's doing with the economy. While you can literally watch the ticker, uh, you know, a thousand points dropped off of the Dow that day. <laughs> It's just, it's crazy. I mean, and, and yet they just continue to gaslight us like this is all, you know, normal and the way it's supposed to go. And Well, that actually brings up an interesting point. So who are they actually talking to? If it's, they're not talking to people like us, and they're clearly not, right? Because people like us will see right through that. Then who are they really talking to? Are they talking to the vote blue no matter who crowd who's simply never going to pay attention to anything else? Are they just... Is that the is that who their their audience is now? They're no longer even trying to talk to to the American people as a whole. They're just trying to talk to their hardcore supporters. I feel like with these echo chambers, that's the game now. I mean, they put something out and they know that they have a, a reliable media source. Uh, speaking of which, reliable sources, which I guess isn't around anymore. <laughs> with uh, Brian Stelter's show on CNN, it wasn't, wasn't very reliable. Now, <laughs> exactly. Was it? But uh, you know, they, they had these reliable sources that they could rely on to get their message out. Uh, so whatever the White House was pitching, they they put it out there and. That's that's kind of the game now, I think, is that you say something, you give enough that you can convince your sheep to go along with you, and then you've, you just let it roll at that point, and you understand that the other side is going to be saying, hey, that's, that's not true, but you just keep your sheep convinced, and that's all that matters, I think, is to keep your flock from leaving. <laughs> and that is very dangerous for the future of society. Right. For, forget the politics. Forget it. It's just dangerous for the future of society because we're no we can no longer talk to each other. Yeah. We, we're no longer even having the same discussion. We're not even it's like we're reading two different books. We're, it's not even we're in different chapters of the same book, which is sometimes hard enough to have a conversation. Right. But you've got one person reading one book and another person reading a completely different book. 
And then we're trying to sit down and have a conversation about a way to move forward, and it's no surprise that we can't. So what do we do? How do we get this? How do we force our politicians or, you know, to talk to everybody again? Well, you know, I, I just wanted to give a concrete example of what you were just saying about uh, items where we're essentially on two different narratives of the exact same story. And one of them, I, I think it's just front and center, is January 6th, because uh, January 6th, you literally have one side that is saying that, hey, look, this is Pearl Harbor. This is 9-11. Uh, this, is, this is crazy. This was something where uh, essentially uh, a guy in a uh, bearskin was going to try and take over the country, <laughs> I guess. And, and then you have yet a perspective on the other side that, hey, look, you have a lot of people who were angry after a year or two of lockdowns, and they thought maybe the election might have been stolen from them, and they were out there to protest, and they were angry. And, and so you, you literally have these ex massively different descriptions of the same event, you know, where one side claiming it was an extraordinarily violent protest. The other side, uh, literally, uh, almost no weapons at all, I think, and uh, you, they wound up having, the, the only person that literally got killed at the Capitol that day was on the protester side. So it was uh, just absolutely crazy. And yet they were trying to tell us that multiple policemen had died on that same day. And it turned out afterwards that, well, not it's not quite true that... Uh, uh, one of these policemen died, but uh, it was the day after, and uh, you know it may have been stress related. Hard to tell what that was from, but you know, so it's just. And yet, the 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 story that was told on the news for that for that side of the spectrum was that this police officer had been beaten to death with a fire extinguisher at the Capitol. So I mean, the idea that the narratives can be so wildly different is just it's scary, like you're saying. And well, I'm a student of history, and so last night, oddly enough, last night I was watching a. A, a short documentary on the Whiskey Rebellion. I mean, we're, you know, if you want to talk here about an actual re rebellion against the government, the Whiskey Rebellion was it. And what's interesting is the Whiskey Rebellion, there was only two people prosecuted about the whole Whiskey Rebellion. And this is where the people actually took up arms against the government, actually formed a 7,000-man army, and were preparing to invade Pittsburgh. They were literally outside of Pittsburgh, and, well, <laughs> this is funny, in order for the Pittsburgh, the leaders of Pittsburgh, in order to get this army to, to not invade with them, sent them barrels of whiskey. <laughs> so, hey, don't invade Pittsburgh, we're going to send you barrels of whiskey, and so they got drunk instead of invading, invading Pittsburgh, and, and well, this eventually is what got George Washington up to, to declare an a insurrection. Uh, he assembled a 13,000-man army and started to to, mar to go march them, and they dispersed. But there was only, you know, all the leaders went and fled to Spanish territory, so they couldn't be convicted. And only, of course, a couple, the, like, arrested, what, 10 people? Only 10 people had enough evidence to get arrested. Um, only eight of them actually didn't have enough evidence to get arrested, so they, it was only two people who actually got charged and convicted. And they were actually sentenced to death, but George Washington pardoned them. Wow. So when an actual rebellion happened, nobody was, there was no punishment. And the, the reason there was actually no, ultimately no punishment, uh, at least legal punishment, from the federal government was because it didn't serve any purpose. Hmm. It's, we have to repair this country. The, the Whiskey Tax Act was brutal to the people in western Pennsylvania and the western it, it was just a complete disconnect on the, the whiskey tax. Cert, certainly more invasive than a tea tax that uh, <laughs> yeah. well, cost the whole revolution. Well, it's, <laughs> it's actually very interesting. It's because it, you have to go search it out. But there was no cash out in the, in the mm -hmm. West. And so over the Appalachian Mountains, there was no cash that side. And so everybody, so the farmers were subsistence farmers. They mm -hmm. traded whiskey as their you know, as their mon monetary supply was whiskey. You know, they, mm -hmm. when they wanted to pay for the next year's seed, they paid for it in whiskey. <laughs> and it's interesting because a lot of the stuff, too, back in the early days of the country, you know, there was a lot of funny money because essentially the government had had to print a lot of money in order to fight the wars and stuff. So I'm not sure how well that lined up with this exact act, but it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, if you had a, uh, you know, money supply that wasn't very stable as well. Yeah. Well, and what ended up happening is that the government came in, wanted money from people who literally didn't have any cash. All they had was, was food and whiskey. And they were supposed to pay tax on the whiskey that they made from their excess food. And, so, and it just, but, you know, they were thinking of it from a Philadelphia perspective where I've got distillers who are making, they're, they're fine. They just pass it on to their customers. It's no big deal. 
But on the other side of the mountains, in the rural areas, they had no comprehension about what this, the impact of this law would be. And so these are the people who had literally just fought a revolution. So their solution to being ignored was to fight a revol another revolution. <laughs> And, but my point about that whole is, if you want to think January 6th was an insurrection, it was not. If you want to think something that was closer to an insurrection, it was actually the summer before, where you had months and months of violence. Yeah. And that was far closer to what actually happened in the Whisco Rebellion, which had a year and a half of violence before you actually got to the, to the point where people assembled an army. Well, not only that, too, but in places like Seattle, where they literally had their... I think they called it the chop zone at first, and I, I can't remember what they eventually called it, but um, essentially the government of Seattle literally handed over six city blocks to uh, a, a makeshift police force <laughs> of the of the community. They, they literally abandoned uh, the police quarters that was in that area, and if you lived there, suddenly there were armed people who didn't work for the government walking around, and claiming that they're the new police force. <laughs> if threatening the authority of the government was really yeah. the issue, then it should have been when ever the people were threatening the authority of the government. Because yeah. that's actually the problem was, was they wouldn't let tax collectors te collect taxes. And that's what actually kind of got the whole thing started with the Whiskey Rebellion. And this is the same thing. When you have people attacking courthouse, federal courthouses in Portland and other cities, but no one gets upset over that, but yet somehow because they attack the, you know, the, oh... Congress, yeah, it, it somehow becomes this big cold thing. It's just and, and certainly as an attack, it was very much in line with a, a protest. I mean, you know, you literally had a bunch of angry people there. They they certainly uh, you know uh, uh, violated the the entryways of, of the Congress. They 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 came in uh, and crossed the boundaries. You know, which uh, uh, you know was breaking the law. But uh, aside from that, though, like you said, it, as far as a protest goes, it's really not that far off from what was happening uh, throughout the country in this whole summer of love that uh, the mayor of Seattle said when she handed six blocks over. I mean, can you well, it, it was more peaceful than a lot of the protests that were sure. happening in, in a lot of, the, you know. Yeah, people actually died there. And in Seattle, uh, they, they handed over this area and it ended with the people who were the makeshift police force killing several people there. <laughs> so it's just well, and we're going we're gonna to move on because we want to talk about something. Um, government likes to dictate these days, dictate the tone, dictate the conversation. And in California, it's actually even better at this, shall we say, than other places. California is passing a law that wants to make firms disclose their social media policies. And on the, safe, on the surface, it seems, okay, what's wrong with that? But you have politicians wanting to force these social media companies to disclose how they are censoring people. That's actually what this is. How are you censoring people who have ideas we don't like? That's what they're actually going to do. And then if they don't like those policies, if your policies aren't in their what, interest, if their policies aren't as strong as they would like in the direction they would like, then they are going to use what social pressure, political pressure, legal pressure to get you to change them. And that is actually the big, far bigger danger, is that we now have government using legal means to pressure social media companies to censor people. Yeah, we, which kind of circles back to what we were talking about earlier. I mean, the, the scary thing we saw this with COVID was, uh, you know, uh, literally the, the government and social media companies sort of getting together to say, hey, look, uh, you're not you're not saying the narrative that's coming from the who. You're not saying the narrative that's coming from the CDC. Therefore, uh, it doesn't matter what your credentials are. Uh, it, and quite frankly, it shouldn't even matter. The, the bottom line is, if you know everybody, uh, you know should be able to talk. And you know nobody has to listen. But <laughs> you know the bottom line is to for government to be colluding with these social media companies to to shut people down who aren't going with the official narrative. That's scary stuff. I, that, you know, we're really getting into an Orwellian situation. And it's not even discussion. Have we seen it? We've had we on your show, your podcast, and this show here. We get um, shall we say not censored, not quite censored on YouTube. We don't get censored anymore, but we do get shadow banned on YouTube. Right? It's very hard for people to find us. If you search for us on, on YouTube, you have to put us in quotes. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to find us. And we get that without even talking anti-narrow. We just bring up guns. We bring up the gun issue, and you get shadow banned. 
doesn't even matter what you talk about about guns. If you just say the gun word, you can you get shadow banned. So you have people who or even want to talk about guns, uh, gun control in a way that people would like. You have to talk about it in a circular way. You can't say gun control. You have to say you have you you still have to talk around it because the algorithm. So nope, they mentioned guns. It's off, and somehow it's not advertiser friendly. Which makes no sense. If you can't make a, <laughs> that, that is the biggest cop out. Because if you can't sell sell uh, advertisements on place things that are advertiser not advertiser friendly, well then you're looking for the wrong advertisers. Because there's all kinds of people who would love to put ads up on anybody, right? Anybody that's getting views, I want an ad running, right? That's there's a lot of businesses that will do that. So if you're not doing that, it's not really advertisers front. It's not about advertisers. It's about you want a specific message. And you're lying, saying it's advertisers. It's about advertisers because it's not. It's about the advertisers you want. Yeah. Well, and and, and whatever uh, rationale they're given, the bottom line is uh, it, it, we we already know there's there's evidence that's already come out that uh, you know Facebook has already mentioned that they've uh, you know had the FBI come and contact them. Uh, we saw this with the Hunter Biden laptop issue before the. Uh, uh, before the 2020 election, where they suppressed that information, uh, you know, essentially the the FBI trying to tell them it was Russian misinformation before it got to them, and and the FBI was in possession of the laptop at the time, so they knew it wasn't Russian misinformation. But they were going around telling social media companies, "Beware of this Russian disinformation that's coming your way," and uh, you know, getting them to essentially censor this stuff. And it's scary stuff when your government is literally trying to control the narrative that's happening. In, because in it, that becomes a point where now the government is actually election interfering, right? Yes. Isn't that election interference? And you've got the bureaucrats, a bureaucracy, interfering in an electoral process by, you know, framing information. You know, whether that, inf you know, it's not their job to frame information, right? Their job is to prosecute crimes. That's yeah. investigate and prosecute crimes, not to frame the narrative, not, not to control what people think. Their job is to quite literally investigate and prosecute crimes. And if they're prosecuting words, then thought has become a crime. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, far, far more dangerous, quite frankly, than many of these other issues we're facing with today. Well, quite frankly, too, we should have all been put on notice about this by Eric Snowden when Eric Snowden came out and uh, essentially sacrificed his his uh, well-being for the rest of us by letting us all know that, hey, look, the government is telling you that it's not spying on you, and it absolutely is. And he proved to us that these leaders are coming in front of Congress. They're being asked if they're monitoring you know, the U.S. citizens, they say no, and, and absolutely they are. And, and, you know, fortunately we had, we have patriots like him that we're not honoring by pardoning him. I, I can't imagine uh, somebody who doesn't deserve a pardon more than Eric Snowden does. And it just, uh, it, it's absolutely sickening that, you know, that that, that man is sitting uh, in Russia uh, losing uh, a fair portion of his life uh, because uh, we are too cowardly as a society to stand up and thank him for uh, his service. <laughs> well, and if you're going to prosecute Snowden for violating for violating the, his, his, the duties of his job, but why aren't we prosecuting the people who violated the constitutional rights of millions of Americans? Yeah. Why, I mean, why aren't we prosecuting the leaders that he literally said were lying to us, and we have video of them lying to Congress about this? They're not in jail, but Eric Snowden is is in exile. Is in exile, yeah. And when we talk about why should we tell the truth, well, if the politicians and the government officials can sit there and lie to Congress, why can't anybody? Yeah. I mean, why is it such a big deal that— if I went to Congress and told Congress of some lie, I'd, I'd get thrown in jail, at least in contempt of Congress, right? That would be the very least that would happen. But yet, an uh, FBI official, a CIA official, an NSA official can go in there and completely lie. We can know they're lying with provable facts, and nothing, literally nothing happens. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, I, I can't think of a better litmus test for liberty uh, then for the next person who runs for president, uh, uh, who's not Biden, <laughs> who who says, hey, look, I'm going to pardon Eric Snowden and I'm going to pardon Julian Assange because these people are literally uh, have have sacrificed massively uh, for our in order to illuminate us on what the government is is hiding from us. And it's just terrible that we're not 
uh, with, that we're letting these people suffer. Yeah, uh, I just I just don't know if the deep state will allow it. Mm. I, I just don't know if you know. There's it, we'll, we'll see what we see what happens when the establishment, the deep state, the political establishment, doesn't like what someone in office does. They they go after them or their friends or whatever, and there's control there. So, and it doesn't surprise me. I'm not entirely sure that that's going to be able to get done, regardless of someone's intention when they go into office. I just don't think it's going to be allowed to happen. But the thing about things that aren't going to be allowed to happen, <laughs> Senator Rand Paul has introduced a, a broadcast deregulation bill to deregulate broadcast, you know, networks, things like this, where you know, so we can don't have to worry so much about what we say. But it turns out that's never going to pass, at least in this particular Congress. And my doubt is it's not going to pass in any Congress because they like controlling things. Congress likes to control things, and so they're never going to give up this uh, uh, sense of control that they get. But we have to at least give Rand Paul some credit for at least saying it, saying that this is what needs to happen. We have too much control. We have too much censorship in this country, and the only way out of it is to get the government out of it. Yeah, no, that's uh, generally the best way with everything. The only uh, caution in deregulation that people should always be aware of, though, is that uh, you, you want to make sure that as you deregulate that you, uh, you don't just partially deregulate, you know, just pull a few things out here, pull a few things out there without really paying attention to make sure that you're not leaving some crazy incentives. We had something like that with the electricity uh, or the, the, the grid here in California back in the days of Gray Davis, and they passed a deregulation, but it only deregulated part of the industry. So you had these uh, crazy incentives that, uh, that essentially forced, uh, uh, I, I can't remember exactly how it worked, but I think it forced the energy companies to buy from, uh, you know, at certain prices, but the other side of the industry wasn't regulated, and so it allowed them to game it to the point where you had companies like Enron that were essentially holding them over a barrel uh, and, and were able to manipulate supply into the market. Uh, so so you got to be kind of a little bit careful and make sure that you deregulate everything and not well, just little bits and pieces. I call that one, I call that one re-regulation. I don't even call it. It wasn't deregulation. You actually ended up with more regulations after deregulation than yeah. you end up with. the. It's not deregulation, right? It's yeah. By definition, if you have more regulations afterwards, it's not deregulation. But that was a mess. They, yeah. they, forced, the, they forced the power-creating companies to, to sell off their transmission, their transmission services to, or spin off their transmission services. So you completely... You had this transmission companies and you had power creation companies, but the transmission companies were heavily regulated, but the power creation companies weren't regulated. And so, yeah, it became this whole big old huge mess. And so now we end up with it even worse where the government controls the power. <laughs> And so we've gone, we made it even worse, which, we'll, which if we have time, we'll talk about later. <laughs> but U.S. income inequality has risen during Biden's first year. You know, they come in, Biden comes into office about, you know, tax the rich, eat the rich, all that kind of, you know, we love poor people. And yet it turns out that the end result of their policies is poor people get hurt and rich people are making out. Like bandits. Well, you have no further to look than New York and California to see what uh, Democrat leftist dystopias do as far as income inequality. You, they're literally the two biggest states in the country for homelessness. So you have all these people living in tents on the street near some of the wealthiest celebrities <laughs> in the country. I mean, you know, either whether you're in Manhattan and all of the wealth that's there or near Hollywood and all of these fabulously wealthy stars uh, living. Or, or, and, or San Francisco and all the tech industry where it's all wealth down there. It's, it's and and Nancy mess. Pelosi with her walls keeping people out. <laughs> <laughs> her compound. <laughs> yeah, it's no surprise to us, right, the, yeah. the income equality, because oddly enough, when you focus on when you focus on it, you're actually just going to create more of it. I mean, it's whatever you focus on, you're actually going to create more of. And so it's not really a surprise to me, but it sure is a surprise to them. Yeah. Well, this, this is a problem with planning. Uh, you know, a, a market uh, thrives on voluntary interaction and uh, supply and demand transmitting information via price signals. And when you have government planners coming in, uh, manipulating things, telling people they're going to give them money to do X and they're going to give them money not to do Y and uh, they're going to take money from so-and-so and all these other things. I mean, it's essentially, you, you wind up not having people interacting morally and voluntarily with each other, but now they're all playing government to try and get different uh, incentives. It makes things wildly 
uh, inefficient. It, it has all kinds of perverse incentives. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there's certain incentives that cause people it to be easier to be homeless in a place like California where, you know, there, there may be more assistance for, uh, you know, living on the street and doing drugs and, and such. Uh, I remember when COVID hit, they were literally putting people in hotels and giving them free drugs. And I, <laughs> it's hard to imagine anything that's more uh, perverse of an incentive than that as far as having a healthy society. Yeah, it's, it's the incentive that they create during these, uh, the desire to manipulate society, the desire to control society. You create these strange incentives that uh, have severely unintended consequences. And we're going to talk about unintended consequences because California the other day has kind of mandated this electrification of California, right? Everything now has to be electric. Your stoves, everything. <coughs> and, including, and now they've mandated by like 2035 or something, they want all new cars sold to be electric. Or actually not just electric, they did leave it in so you can get uh, hydrogen cars. <laughs> so, so it's not purely electric. You can get one of the hydrogen cars. It's, it's zero emission, which, it, for most practicality's sake, is electric. So, yeah. yeah so, I, so I like Tail the hydrogen emission. I actually like <laughs> hydrogen cars. I think hydrogen is probably the way of the future because you don't deal with the battery issue because having to dispose of batteries. So, hydrogen is my preferred future. But now that they now that they've got it figured out, they got the uh, fuel cells figured out. But the day after they announced this 2035 date, like literally two days after this, they tell the people who with, with electric cars now, uh, be careful when you charge those things up because we, we're going to need that electricity. during the, So wait until after night, wait until after nine or first thing in the morning. Don't charge it up during the heat of the day. And well, but in the heat of the day is when, you know, our solar panels should be working at most efficient. And it's actually nowadays, it's the heat of the day when you want to be running things, theoretically. If you're on solar panels, if you're on solar, it's the <laughs> middle of the night where you have to be careful with your, with your electricity. But California's grid is not ready for this future, and yet they're mandating it. Well, I think it's in the, in the uh, late afternoon that's the big problem because everybody is sort of shifting from uh, the office to going home. Although now, I guess most people are home all day <laughs> because of COVID policy. But but then that's when a lot of people then start their uh, you know big uh, uh, um, big appliances. Yeah, that's uh, when the air like conditioners at the office are still running, and people are starting to turn the air conditioners on at home. And they're turning their ovens on, and they're turning their yeah. washer and dryer on, and all those things. And all the if you think about the way solar panels work, solar panels are work the most efficient right right between like noon and three, noon and mm -hmm. four, something like that. Pretty and much so, when the sun is is most uh, yeah. So, light so as it gets it. later yeah. in the afternoon, it be, the the effectiveness of solar panels drops off, which is actually right when we need the power the most. And so you end up with these. It's just, uh, do these people actually think these things through? Well, well, you know what's so upsetting is that, you know, if if you really are uh, trying to uh, have a, a carbon friendly uh, uh, energy source, uh, you know, we, we had nuclear power plants here in California at one time. We used to have. Uh, uh, a, a power plant here in Sacramento, um, Rancho Seco, and, uh, and uh, there was another one uh, down, uh, I can't remember, somewhere near Morro Bay down there someplace. And, um, but they've shut a lot of these things down because of their fear of nuclear. Well, they're, they're calling climate an existential crisis, and yet they're shutting down, they're, they're not even thinking about nuclear power, and yet nuclear power is zero, you know. <laughs> and that's our existential crisis. Thank you, Jason. We are just about out of time. Thank you all for being here with us this week. We appreciate it. Um, <laughs> and I did it again. I mistimed my exit. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for being with us. We, you can watch us on Access Sacramento on th Thursday nights at 8 o'clock. It's, again, Saturday night sometime in like 2 a.m. Sunday morning here on Access Side on Channel 17. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week. Oh, yes, and we get sometimes we get this thing where we get to stay on and talk, Jason, so, <laughs> because sometimes we don't get off the air on time, and so we get to make just sit there and talk about whatever we get to talk about just to have the air filled up, and we get to stretch. Hey, at least the lights are on. <laughs>